Hello, everyone. My name is Ben Marchman, host of the Firekeepers Global Summit, in which we will gather for powerful conversations with cutting edge experts and thought leaders who will guide you to connect to your truest self and activate your natural gifts. This event is designed to reinstate the importance of carrying our soul directed vision back into our communities so that ourselves and our communities will flourish. Here you're invited to learn how to seek the guidance of your inner voice so you can truly understand what it means to live life with purpose. So excited to talk to a good friend, um, mentor and teacher of mine, um, Cater Brown, who will be discussing the topic of rites of passage ceremony and the delivery of your medicine for the people. And I kind of want to wel welcome Cater and by um, a quote that many of the listeners and the um, viewers might know where this quote's coming from, from Melodoma Some, who's a world-renowned author, teacher, and initiated elder of West, West Africa, um, and is also a shaman. And so Melodoma says that, I have known Cater for a long time as a man of spirit with remarkable devotion to healing. He tends to his duty with royalty and ferocious commitment. As a man who hears the call of the earth and nature, Cater extends his hand to those in quest of change and transformation and is always willing to lead them into and guide them through a deep sense of communion with themselves. Having worked with him in a number of rituals and ceremonies and watched carefully the way he gives of himself to spirit, I've come to respect his priestly devotion to the sacred and nature in every human. His work deserves respect and reverence. Very powerful words. Yeah. And I'm, I'm gonna let uh, Cater yeah. also welcome in the group and welcome in himself. So thank you, Cater. Thanks, Ben. Yes, welcome everybody. And uh, I wanna begin with offering some gratitude. and. Uh, Gratitude to my teachers and to their teachers before them. And also gratitude to all those who have walked a path of awakening their soul-directed vision. Um, all across the world, there have been various ways that people have found to do that, often by going into nature and spending some time there under the guidance of an elder and, uh, and praying and fasting and returning with some fire burning in their, in their belly, in their heart, for their people. So I want to also offer gratitude to the ancestors and all those that have come before us. Um, and gratitude for our descendants that walk ahead of us and watch to see how we live our lives so they, they will know what to do when they get here. So I want to thank them for that trust and that accountability. Um, and may the words that I have to offer you uh, to the vision. Ashe. All right. Let's dive in. <laughs> so where shall we begin, Ben? Did you have a, a question or you want me to just start talking? I think you're on mute still, Ben. You're yeah, sorry about that. I double clipped. I was clicking somebody else's um, audio off because there's some background noise there on somebody's. Um, yes, so thank you, Cater, for that. And I'm just helping everybody welcome into the chat here as well. There's some people asking in the chat. Um, and I guess before we dive into um, I, I guess all the questions cater because we can go in so many different directions with your work. Um, I wonder if you wanted to give, kind of start from an overview first on kind of like your personal journey and how you came into this work of rites of passage ceremony and divination work, as well as your indigenous perspectives on ritual and, and so much more. <laughs> yeah. Um, happy to do that it, it's uh it's a journey that began uh probably before i was born um now that i've traced some of the lineage of of what's happened 
Um, but I would definitely say uh, the calling. If we talk about rites of passage has in, having very distinct stages of calling, severance, threshold, and return, um, the calling in my life happened with my father's uh, death um, when I was 32. Um, that's like 28 years ago. And um, before then, when I was around 14, I had this vision and this desire to go into the wilderness under the guidance of an elder um, and be left there for some period of time. I didn't know what it was called. I didn't have a name for it. And nobody in my world really knew about that type of ceremonial experience. So it went underground and then resurfaced when my father died. I was 32 and uh, working as a psychotherapist at the time. And following his death, he came to me in a dream. And we were standing in a, a, a little library and he pulled a book off the shelf and he gave it to me and it said Vision Quest. Now he sold Mack trucks. This wasn't his world. <laughs> um, Following that dream, um, I tracked down such a book and found Stephen Foster and Meredith Little at School of Lost Borders um, and uh, began to consider doing such a, uh, an experience, going on this vision fast, vision quest. And, uh, but I wasn't sure because as, you, as things, uh, the greatest things, the greatest medicine often we carry is also something that terrifies us the most. And, um, so I was thinking about doing this and not sure. And the next thing that happened is I uh, went home and I laid out these, I think they were called sacred path cards at the time. And I uh, turned them upside down and drew one. It said vision quest, shuffled them, drew another. It said vision quest, shuffled them, drew another. And three times I drew the same card randomly out of a shuffled deck. Um, and it was at that moment I realized something really important is happening here. Um, something way bigger than me. And um, began to consider going on this journey. And then I got invited to, um, a friend invited me to their church. And so I went and I was sitting in the pew and I was envisioning going out on the mountain um, and being out there. And I began to think about my own history and, and spiritual upbringing through Catholicism, how that no longer really resonated for me, but it, but it also put me on the early stages of ritual. Um, and so I was considering that and I thought about the cross, the symbol of the cross in its pre-Christian context had four equal sides and it was a symbol of protection. And so I thought about this and I thought, you know, when I'm out on that mountain and I'm having to deal, deal with every fear that might come up, I'll just, that'll be one of the things I carry in my medicine pouch. So the service ended and I get a tap on the shoulder and I'd only been in this church one time, never been in, never went to it again. Tap on the shoulder and I turn around and there are these two old people, both with really long gray hair. Um, and the old man looks at me and he says, I'm supposed to give you this. And he put that little cross in my hand. And I started to, to weep and all I could say was thank you. Um, still being a little bit hard headed and, and mostly afraid. <laughs> um, I just dropped a few, maybe a week or two later, I dropped my daughter off at the daycare and I came out of the daycare and to set the stage, this is a rural country road in South Carolina. And I walk out of the daycare thinking about, you know, I need to do something and I'm still in the anguish of losing my father. And, uh, and I look up and they're going down this two lane country road or these covered wagons. There were three of them drawn by horses. I wasn't hallucinating. Um, <laughs> and on the side of the wagon, it said vision quest. And again, I just started to weep and pray. And I thought, um, something really like this is really starting to, to, to move me and frighten me more. Um, and then the final, uh, experience of my calling, it was that, uh, I went, uh, I was working as a, th a therapist in private practice and I would drive across the Savannah River and go to this health club and work out several days a week. And it was just another day. I went across, worked out, went down to the locker room and to, to get ready to come back and I grabbed the locker and opened the door and I got shot in the chest by four feathers. 
Um, I didn't know there were four feathers at first. I just felt it hit me and scared the daylights out of me. Um, and I looked around because I, I, it was so hard. It felt like somebody threw something at me. And I went looking around the locker room, you know, even like in the shower, it's like nobody's here. And I walked back to my locker and I looked at it and then I looked down on the floor and there were four feathers that were taped at the end. They were red, yellow, black, and white, um, which at the time had another significant importance to me. So I called a friend and an elder of mine that had connection with the Sun Bear tribe at the time. And all he said is that he listened to the story and said, you better go do this. Uh, or, or they're going to get louder and it may not be as friendly. <laughs> so I wrote a letter. This was in 93. So I wrote a letter to Stephen and Meredith at the School of Lost Boys. I said, I want to come to a quest with you. I need to go far away from home. I don't know why, but I need to. And uh, so he wrote back and said, uh, you know, we appreciate the depth of your story. And, and uh, Meredith and I are getting older now and we're not guiding anymore. Um, but we'll teach you about this ceremony if you want to come out here. And he said, we have one opening next year, and it's in September. So I wrote back and said, I'm in. And the year rolls around. And fast forward to the last night of the quest, which is that symbolic death and rebirth night um, on the mountain in the Sierra Nevada mountains, about 9,000 feet. Um, actually, the third day of the quest, I had a, uh, a vision that came in the form of a chant um, and a lot of grief. And it said, and all it was, was bring the people home, bring the people home. And it was just with me all day, grieving and chanting, bring the people home. The last night of the quest, sitting there on that mountain, um, it occurred to me that it was two years to the very night that my father had died when all of this woke up. Um, this memory woke up in me. And um, so when I came down off that mountain, I knew that I had remembered that this is, this is, the, this is the direction I'm headed. Um, and I say it that way because I think of soul-directed vision. When we say that word, what is soul-directed vision? Um, from my teachers, I learned that a soul-directed vision is more of a memory that's in front of you, not behind you. It's a memory that is laid out in front of you based on agreements you would have made with your ancestors before coming into this world about who you were coming here to be and what medicine you are coming here to offer. Um, and so they, they would say all true learning is simply remembering. Mm -hmm. um, and so finding myself on that path uh, of remembering, um, I began to walk down that path and seek out other, other teachers, um, of course, Stephen and Meredith, um, Rocking Bear and Melodoma, um, those that are not in the physical world. Um, and what first looked like uh, doing deep death lodge process with people in the woods to prepare them to go out on a solo um, began to shift and change when, as things began to happen that were not uh, of the ordinary reality. And so I, uh, being steeped in psychology, I'd gone as far as I could go with psycho psychological explanations and so began to, uh, to sit and learn from indigenous people, uh, primarily uh, Rocky Bear and Melodoma and um, others uh, that I had uh, lesser connections to, but listening to, that could quickly make sense of what I was experiencing and also offer guidance of how to, how to do that, how to work with that. Um, and so that's, that's a quick, a quick uh, thumbnail sketch of kind of how I ended up into this, into this arena. Um, but looking back at that 14 year old boy, um, what I realize now is that the call to initiation, the call to awaken a soul directed vision is something that's in all of us. It's in our bones. It's in our ancestral bone memory. Um, the absence of initiatory rites of passage in our culture, we often don't get those activating experiences that are designed to wake up those memories, to wake up those visions. Um, and so 
as young people sometimes do, they, they will self-create initiations that are more dangerous than they are useful. <clears throat> um, so this, so I look at it now as something that's, that's latent, that's in us, that, that's wanting to be awakened. It's like, uh, if you ever bow drill a fire, you know, you're going to blow on the coal that you find is the hottest to get the fire to ignite. Um, and so that, that, uh, that bone memory of a soul directed vision is in each one of us, like a hot coal waiting for some air, waiting for us to, to blow on it and give it some life. And, uh, and then as it starts to wake up, um, it, you know, it'll lead you down a path of belonging. I want to call it a path of memory and belonging uh, that has been laid out. Uh, and it doesn't mean it'll be easy. Uh, I always say there, there are gatekeepers along the path um, that will challenge you um, and test you um, as you even walk that path. But that's a little bit of my story and, and how I got here. Um, I think of, uh, you know, in my story, it began or got activated by my father's death or at his being at his death, being by his side. Um, and I've learned to think of uh, initiatory rites of passage um, in, in more the global or the pan-cultural context of how... Uh, all our ancient peoples knew this process of going into the wilderness, fasting, praying, uh, being having some solo time out there, and then returning uh, with uh, fire and vision, medicine for their people. Um, when we look at <clears throat> even <clears throat> the uh, you know the major spiritual traditions on the planet, um, all of them began with somebody doing that very thing, going into the wilderness, fasting, praying for vision, and then returning uh, with some medicine for their people. Um, so in that more global context, uh, I think it's something that's uh, in us, that, that's just, uh, as I say, it's just part of our bone memory that, that this is what needs to happen. And in the absence of it, um, and there, there can be all kinds of catastrophes. Um, but if you think of two rivers that uh, flow side by side, going opposite directions, kind of hard to imagine, but imagine it. <clears throat> One river flows in the ordinary reality of our life, and that in this lifetime we can think of birth to death, at least in this one lifetime. And it flows along that way. And the other one flows... Uh, from a different source in the opposite direction and it flows from death to birth and that most if not all great visions or, or journeys begin with loss darkness death um, that's the beginning the darkness the same way in the old calendar we used to celebrate the the old calendar with the beginning was the dark time of the year you know in the celtic tradition they would say Samhain. but this when we enter into that dark time this is the beginning time um so it's just as a word of uh encouragement maybe for those that are struggling uh feeling a dark time that this is the seeding ground um and to seek out some guidance to seek out some support in that time that can help you navigate the territory uh, from a uh, mythological orientation rather than a psychopathological orientation to where we may, you know, get all kind of labels and, and things done that aren't really helpful to the, to the hero or the heroine's journey. Um, and yet to look at it as from a mythological context, um, there is this, this thing that has to die before something can be born. And we don't want to misinterpret that as a literal thing, as some people sadly do. Um, and yet find ways to navigate that soul descent uh, with, with, with someone who knows how to navigate the territory. And certainly there are countless people in the world that know how to do that. Um, 
So that's, uh, yeah, those are some words that initially come, <laughs> come to mind around the whole, the whole journey. I remember Michael Mead saying one time, uh, he said, think of it as there are two, two uh, elemental trajectories uh, of initiation. And one we would say would be by fire. And elementally, that is a, an initiatory ascent. And that is an initiation by fire, meaning uh, uh, like a genie possession, some might call it. Like one is overtaken by a genie, they can't stop. And it has this drive, this passion, this vision that's just propelling them forward. Um, and they too need a guide. Like I've seen people have that kind of genie possession and it, and it can kill you if you don't know how to navigate with that. And then he talks another is the initiatory uh, initiation by the element of water. And water is about a descent, a soul's descent into the river, bottom of the river, soul canyon. Um, and this is initiation into uh, memory and belonging and ancestry and soul and healing and reconciliation. Um, and that's a different kind of trajectory. And it's, it too has its uh, uh, challenges along the way. Um, but when we think about rites of passage, um, that we, we go out on the mountain, we go out on the sacred mountain, um, not for yourself, uh, but for your people, human and non-human people, um, to remember more of who you are so that you may bring this back and deliver it in, in a good way. Um, because uh, the medicine you carry is like your thumbprint. No one else carries what you carry. And your coming here means that you brought something here that the rest of us need. Um, and so finding ways to wake up and activate that, that uh, connection to that medicine you carry and, and bring it, bring it. Because this is a, we live in a time where it's, we don't need more information about what's wrong. <laughs> We need people willing to stand up and, and do and be who they came here to be. Um, so those are some, so that's some of the fire that burns in me. That's some of that, that vision, bring the people home. Um, just to stand, in the, stand in your own medicine because uh, you don't want to be living a life that's not your own when, when you go to join your ancestors. And they say, what? What did you do down there? <laughs> and I love, I just love the whole story, how you weave that in there. It's just, it's so amazing. Um, and bring the people home. That's just, I mean, it's what the summit's all about. <laughs> how, how are we bringing this, you know, how are we bringing this vision that we all are always seeking? Mm -hmm. like, like your elders and teachers that you're saying, it's that question that's always a step ahead of you. Um, mm -hmm. And this and memory that lies in front of us. Yeah, so memory. I to think about it. That it, it's got a familiar frequency to it. The images of it, we know. But we're, we're but the life we're in may not be the one we're headed to. Um, and yet it calls us just as real as if we are remembering something behind us. Hmm. Yeah, definitely. And I, I wonder if you wanted to expound a little bit, Cater, on... Um, We've hinted a lot on rites of passage with um, even with other speakers too, um, but but in your case, I wonder if you want to um, discuss like the stages and how they can show up in our lives today, um, and from your background and wisdom. So the the stages, the the um, awakening to the call. You know, I think as I say, I think it's there. I know it's there when we're little. And I believe up until generally up until the age of four or five, there's still connection. There's not the, the languaging and the, the cognition to communicate that connection. Um, and if there were, it often gets dismissed uh, as, as you know, magical thinking or something. Um, I think it wakes up again in adolescence in, in some raw form. Um, and, uh, but this calling keeps resurfacing, nudging us. Um, and, you know, the calling that I described, the, 
that began that was activated by loss. Um, loss or death or great challenge can can activate the call um, because it's in those those places um, where we're no longer where we were and we're not yet where we're headed and we have no clue of what to do. Um, it's uh, to borrow a phrase from Joanna Macy. It's the that that knife's edge of uncertainty when is when we're most alive, um, and I think it's when we can most be available to hear uh, spirits call to us. Um, so it can be, you know, it can look like a, a that. It can look like uh, an awakening that comes through uh, more pleasant means, kind of like the ones I described and that followed my father's death. These things started to happen. Um, that I couldn't explain. Um, it can happen by illness or tragedy. Um, it, it's something that generally breaks you open um, from the outside, uh, meaning that it's not within your um, it's not within your thought process to choreograph. Um, Ren, I was I remember talking with a person one time, and they said they had choreographed they have discovered that they were um, needed to let go so they had choreographed their own letting go ceremony and I was thinking um, that's not the kind of letting go I think we're, we're talking about here I think we're talking about one where we're broken open mm -hmm. and all we can do is cry out for something unknown um, that kind of surrender um, uh, awakens the call Something, something meets us in that place um, that we recognize but have no clue what it is. Um, and so the calling can look like a lot of different things. But once you respond to the call, there's, there's what I call responding to the call. Or if you think of Joseph Campbell's stages of the, the hero heroine's journey, similarly, similarly so, there's, if you respond to the call and you begin to follow this thread, uh, of, of uh, information or direction um, or then there's the refusing the call and to refuse the call uh, is uh, I guess you could look you could still live a noble life and, and um, you know die well but uh, certain things may escape you um, and at what cost we don't know to, to borrow a couple lines from William Stafford <laughs> Um, but the, uh, but responding to the call, um, is begin to, to follow such a thread of, of nudging and information. Um, and we can recognize it by its aliveness in us. There's a certain aliveness we begin to feel. Um, but what also happens in the, if we think about the second stage of an initiatory passage or rite of passage is called the severance. Um, sometimes I refer to it as the death lodge. Uh, severance is where we begin th those old ways of, of uh, loving. That's what I call them. Old ways of loving begin to uh, get challenged. We have old ways of old, old things we believe, uh, thoughts, feelings, ways of being in the world. They no longer work. Um, and they begin to crack or fade away or, or fall uh, or get taken, you know, just all of a sudden they get swept away. And what we, you know, the beliefs and, and things we counted on are all of a sudden not there. This, this severance phase, so we're, we're severing from either intentionally, uh, can be done intentionally or unintentionally, uh, where we're being severed from certain uh, ways of being in the world and understanding the world that that uh, no longer are no longer there, and so in the severance phase or death lodge phase, uh, we're nudged closer to the threshold. Um, so to uh, to leave one's familiar places, people, attachments, um, to begin to let go of those and respond more deeply to this call requires one to do that. Um, this is what I, call their, uh, what I call the gatekeepers along the way. You encounter certain gatekeepers 
that say you can't you can't bring that past here. You have to put that you have to put that down. You can't do that here. And then you also meet certain guides along the way. They'll say, I'll, I'll show you how to walk across this, this, uh, this river right here. Um, but that's as far as I can take you. And then you'll find somebody else. So they're guides and they're gatekeepers to challenge uh, where offerings have to be made along the way. Um, sometimes those offerings are um, a very way of being or understanding ourselves in this, in this severance phase. Um, and then we come to the threshold phase. The threshold phase is that time in the desert, that time on the mountain. Um, it refers to uh, we're no longer where we were, but we're not yet where we're headed. We're betwixt and between. And in the threshold phase, uh, this, is, uh, this is where we reach out, cry for, uh, fast, pray, go out on the mountain. It's what most people think of when they hear, hear the word vision fast or vision quest or walk about. They think of the solo time, um, but that's a very, uh, that's just one phase of the process. Um, but it's in that experience where you are cracked open even more. And maybe even the very reason that you thought you were going out on this mountain, you, you lose that too. And you wonder what the hell you're doing out there. Um, it's not what you thought and something else begins to happen. Um, but all those masks that we've learned to wear to identify ourselves uh, to ourselves begin to fade away in the stones and the river and the, and the standing tall people. They don't care um, what mask we wear. Um, they're just being themselves. And eventually we find that, that frequency uh, or hear that, that song that is our song. Um, and that looks like a lot of things, but it's, it's usually where I say that's where this connection to something greater than ourselves happens. Um, in the, in the, in the long, long time ago days, there was no guarantee of a survival of a quest or a survival of a rite of passage. Um, the one may literally not survive it. Um, today, most modern day, versions of a rite of passage uh, carry a lot of perceived risk and some real risk, but perceived certainly. Um, and perceived is good too. It'll do the job. Um, so this threshold phase, this uh, reconnecting with something greater, and then this, uh, you know, we have to let go. I say let go so deeply that spring can simply show up because you let go enough. Um, and maybe for no other reason. But in the letting go, the, the clarity starts to filter in. Um, and with that clarity, um, some, some nudging, some organic nudging toward a vision or an action to take. Um, and so now we're talking about the return phase. To, to, you know, in, in the title of, of Ben's summit, that's carrying soul-directed vision. Um, so this return to the village return to your people. Um, it can be thought of as a return and yet uh, to truly have gone through the experience, who's coming off the mountain is not the same person that went on. It's, it's impossible. Uh, but someone returns. Something maybe of the, the more of the blueprint of who you are returns uh, with some images, some uh, of uh, vision or direction of what actions to take. Um, and so you return to your, to your people, to your village, um, carrying this. And a lot of traditions, there's some reenactment of the vision. It could be a dance, it could be a storytelling. There's something that reenacts the experience to, to, as a, as a, uh, as a ceremonial offering, uh, what we call the giveaway. Um, but the real giveaway ceremony is, is how you live your life going forward. It's less about what you say and more about how you live and how, how do you carry this and how do you offer this um, to those that are also looking for a trailhead. Um, maybe you can point them in the direction of that trailhead yourself. 
Um, and so you might want to look under that rock over there. I think there might be something for you. Um, but you carry this, this uh, aliveness back. Um, so the calling, the severance, the threshold, the return, I'd say the incorporation, which can take months, years, a lifetime. Um, this idea of living into the vision. Um, this uh, uh, Carl Jung, uh, the, the famous psychoanalyst, and, and later Joanna Macy and more our time had, had this quote. They said that there, there's a great, a great question that lives inside each one of us. And we're, you're very fortunate if you can find that question. And I would add, may the question be one that, that encompasses a lifetime to live into. And maybe at best is all you can do is hand off the baton to the next generation. Uh, because all you can do is live into it as far as you can and then pass it forward. Um, but that this idea of living into uh, a vision, living into a question, um, reminds me of that, uh, that understanding of medicine names. When people often come off the mountain, there are stories where they, they acquire a new name. And these names are not comfortable when you get them. They shouldn't be comfortable. If they're comfortable, then they're maybe just a description of how people see you currently. Um, but these medicine names are not meant to be comfortable because you have to live into them. And it may take your life to get there. And maybe you don't get all the way there. Um, but they're meant as, as beacons of light uh, on the trail that you can follow. Um, so that when you hear that name spoken, it calls you into a life of belonging, of, of one that you belong to. Um, so I think of the stages that way. Again, the, the calling, the severance, the threshold, the return, the incorporation, and, and the giveaway, um, or how I think about it. Yeah, and thanks for weaving those, <laughs> weaving those in. and. In under an hour. I mean, it can take a lifetime to explain those. <laughs> to live those, certainly. Several, maybe. It's almost like we could do this whole hour in um, those stages, if you think mm -hmm. about it. Um, <laughs> even though we're online. Um, yeah, thank you, Cater, for um, expounding on that. Mm -hmm. and, <clears throat> and kind of going into like the navigation piece, which we're always wondering. And yeah, and I love that um, quote by Joanna Mace. Carl John and I guess later Joanna Macy and maybe we all live into that. I think that's a really uh, more than practical way to look at it. <laughs> to, find, to find the great question that, yeah. that burns inside of you that you want to live into to, to, to bring some, some, some medicine to. It's, um, we're not really at the top of the hour yet, but I did want to make sure we had some time to like really expound a little bit more on like another piece. If, if you want to go that direction. Um, you have to keep me on track. I don't have a clock. So I'm just, yeah. yeah. Um, this past work with you, it's hard to, for both of us to stay on track. Um, yeah, so like when someone <laughs> say what the rabbit hole, the, the rabbit holes that we can all go down. Um, which I've definitely done with fast speakers. So, yes, yeah, so we, we, we kind of touched base a little bit too at the beginning, like navigating that territory of um, carrying a soul-directed vision and like how to better understand that. And so I, I'm sure, I'm assuming a lot of the listeners and viewers are kind of asking like maybe the how question or like when we know, when would be a really hard one to, um, I guess, answer, but like um, when or how, do we know when we're in that soul communication space and like how to navigate that? Well, to, um, you know, to, to set yourself on a course of intentionally stepping into these uh, stages with a guide of some, of some, someone that can, whether you do it without necessarily having to disconnect from your life for months or you just over time, you do a little bit of time, um, the preparation for such a thing is uh, 
also to uh, live your life with death as your ally. That's what I've learned. Um, not an easy practice, but to live life as, with death as your ally means you live passionately and, and stay awake. Um, and uh, you move toward the, the threshold phase uh, set in your life in, in order as if you were to leave this world at that time, since it's a death and a rebirth experience. Um, <clears throat> so you begin to enter, in a way you enter the death lodge of the severance, which is, you know, who do I need to speak with? What do I need to, to do to make right so I can have a, this, a good death? You know, as they say, to, to have a good death means you live the good life. <clears throat> so what, what is unresolved in my heart uh, to, have a, to have a good death? Um, and set about doing that so that you are cleaning up whatever baggage might be weighing on you before the threshold phase. Even if, even if you do say like a one night or a, a day in nature, um, it's the intention moving toward the ceremony. Um, and uh, one, uh, um, I'll give you a, a one good death lodge uh, ritual that I like that I sometimes give out is <clears throat> it can be an all night fire vigil. I did this on a, a quest myself a few years ago <clears throat> where you set a fire, and if you can't do this outside, you set a candle. But fire is very much part of the situation, <laughs> it's the element of, of activation. So you set a fire, campfire that you can spend the night with or a candle you can sit with. And on the other side of the fire, you set a seat uh, for um, anyone that needs to come to your fire during the night. So if you're camping doing this, you have enough wood and I'm, uh, you wanna have a small fire because it requires a lot of small wood to keep it going and that keeps you awake. So you feed the fire throughout the night. Um, you do an invocation and you call upon, uh, let, the, let the universe know and the spirits know that you are, uh, and your ancestors know that you are opening your death lodge um, and you're calling on the support of your helping, helping ancestors to sit with you um, during the night. And the seat across the fire is meant for anyone that shows up. Um, and here's the thing what your job is to not think about who you need to talk to, but just to sit there and tend fire and know that whoever needs to come to that fire will come to that fire. And they'll surprise you all of a sudden you're aware that, Oh, this person's there. And maybe they're not a surprise. Maybe you expected them, even though you weren't thinking about them and, and their words to be spoken or something to be listened to. Um, and this goes on through the night. Maybe there are hours in between visitations. Um, you're just tending fire. Um, <clears throat> at the, uh, as, as the sun, before the sun starts to rise, we enter that phase we call the false dawn, where it starts to get light and you think the sun's going to come up. It seems like it takes for hours. <laughs> so you enter that period of false dawn. You let the fire start burning down. And uh, as, it, as it burns down to ashes, um, and the sun starts to rise. And, and just to back up a little bit, you want to orient yourself looking west across the fire into the west to do this ritual. Um, so that as the sun rises behind you, um, you step, if you're doing a fire, you step into the ashes of your old life. Maybe even put a little bit on you like the phoenix. And then you turn and you face east, you face the rising sun, you face your new life. And you don't know what's ahead on that. You don't know what's down that road, but you, know, it is, you, you do know that you've come to this crossroads of completion. And so as the sun rises, you step out of the ashes of your old life, stepping into the east, into the rising sun, and you walk toward that new day. Um, and so that's, a, that's what I call it, like a death lodge ritual or a severance ritual. Um, that's, uh, that one can enact. Um, my suggestion, if you're going to be camping, doing this during the night, um, that when you walk away from that fire, that it not be a place you go back to, at least for a year. Um, if then, 
maybe you don't ever go back there, but you want to set your gear into the east. So when you turn and step away, you pick it up and you walk east, you know, head out. Um, so that's an all night fire vigil. It's, it's a really uh, good, uh, I call severance ritual, or it could be done during a solo time. Um, and then the other more simply is again, live, live with death as your ally. It's a, it's a teaching in many sacred traditions, which really means to, to live life with full compassion and aliveness and to love fiercely and, and uh, without fear. Um, and speak the truth, and be impeccable with, with your words and, and actions. Um, so that would be, again, plugging yourself into some kind of a, the initiatory passage, understanding those phases would be a good way to, um, and then having some kind of guide that you can touch base with along the way as you're in those passages. Um, and then the return. Um, the return I consider the most difficult <clears throat> because when, <clears throat> when you return from such an experience, be it four days and nights or even doing that, nobody really knows or understands what you just did. And so uh, finding other people that understand um, and can, can mirror back for you what they hear in your story is important because um, that will be the hardest part is how to keep that fire burning, you know, as you return. Yeah, I can agree with that. <laughs> um, and, you know, we'll make sure we have time for some um, questions too. I had a couple questions arise on that, but um, don't want to uh, go, I guess, too far over, which... Um, but also, like, since we're, I guess you kind of went into a little bit of ritual too, and there's so much, so many other questions that I wanted to ask you, um, <laughs> and like how that can assist us um, moving forward. I'm kind of having feeling like an energy to like help the um, group interact with you, if you if you don't mind. Like maybe we can start some um, dialogue, and we can kind of create. Um, I wouldn't say ritual, but create like a sacred dialogue around what that means to people in the group like yeah I can unmute all these mics that i see that sure yeah <laughs> <clears throat> i know some of you uh, might be on your phone so when i unmute and there's background noise and i'll just mute you <clears throat> so i'm gonna unmute everybody and if you want to interact with cater on anything that's kind of came up then um I guess the best way we kind of did this last call is um, if you have a candle, raise your candle up to your face and kind of wave it. It's kind of like raising your hand or just raise your hand and uh, we'll, uh, click on you and send everybody talk at once. And here we go. <laughs> All right, laughter. Let's begin with that. <laughs> Vicky. Everybody's got to get up and go get a candle. <laughs> oh, no, you can just, you can <clears throat> just to kind of hold up your lighter or pretend like you got a candle. Well, for those that don't have any faces on the thing. <laughs> uh, oh, there, there's a candle. Okay. Yes, Vicky. Hi. Hi, good to see you again. Good to see you, my friend. <laughs> I, I for completely forgot and missed the first half of this talk, but oh, I hope you're recording. Part. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like a personal problem. It's good to see you, and your words are, are fabulous. Uh, I did want, but I can give it later. I'll listen to the recording, those steps that you had, the calling, the severance, all of those. I had never heard all of those in order, so mm -hmm. thank you very much for that. You're quite welcome. Does anybody have like a burning, um, a burning memory that uh, they're trying to reach? As Cater was kind of pointing at that they're working on, or or it could be a question from something he said. Yeah. Or notice what in all that conversation caught your attention and won't let you go, and then say something about that. <laughs> okay, I'll raise my hand. Okay, yeah, go ahead, Valerie. Oh, no, this is Vicka. Go ahead, Vicka. Oh, yeah. Hi. Oh. Is, <laughs> I don't know if I'm supposed to put 
push any buttons or anything, but um, this is Vika. And um, hi, Cater. It was hey, good, good to see you again. You again. Um, I guess what got activated in me as I was listening to you was being um, present to the seasons, especially because I'm normally on Maui where you don't see season quite in the same way as you do on the mainland. And so now that I'm temporarily uh, this week here in Boston, it's so cold and there's so much less light and things like that. And so I've been thinking about the seasonal transitions and coming to um, in bulk. And for me, how um, I've always held this to be a very um, encouraging and hopeful time because um, as whatever, whatever passage I might be moving through, um, I've always felt that at this time, even though I can't really see sort of the light at the end of the tunnel or spring or even next summer or any of those things, I'm still in uh, a bit of darkness. I know in my deepest soul that there is this quickening underground that's happening, underground within me, underground within the actual ground, and, you know, that the dreams that live there, um, the dreams that are part of the calling that you were just talking about, um, they will be born. You know, it might, it'll be a birth canal experience, but um, birth will happen and spring will come. And even though sometimes, I think you mentioned it somewhere in there about we don't need to talk anymore about how dark things are, or I don't remember exactly what your words were, but yeah, it's true. It's like, we are, we've got plenty of darkness around us. And so this time of year for me just is a time where I can use that, even if it's just one candle, that little bit of light to carry me forward. We're past solstice. We're moving into more light and the dreams and visions that I carry um, may not all be clear or visible at this time, but they're coming. So uh, that's what was kind of alive in me as you were speaking. Thank yeah, you. thanks for sharing. Mm. Yeah. Is anyone else? No questions. About some answers. Questions. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, go ahead, Valerie, and yes. speak a little closer to your mic if you can. Yep. Question. How do I know who my people are? <clears throat> um, <laughs> the, the crossroads where your passion intersects with the needs of your people, in that, in that crossroads where you feel most alive, where they recognize what you have to offer is something they need. Who is they? Uh, your people. Who, who are they? <clears throat> so it's, it also is about s standing up more clearly, we could say casting a bigger shadow of the medicine you carry, what you have to offer, so that you can become visible to those that are looking for you. Um, because there are, there are ones looking for you um, that you are also looking for. And what they're looking for is this genius that you in particular carry. Um, and so instead of looking for them so much, really stand in that medicine, stand in that genius, stand in that beauty that you are. Um, and then you become visible to the ones that are looking for you, ones we will call your people. Um, and those are human and non-human. I use that term loosely, people. Um, but this search for belonging um, that you speak of um, may also uh, be uh, require some uh, kind of some ancestral line clearing healing if it's a uh, if it's something that has been set in place a pattern of lost belonging that has pre-existed you that has been following you your life um, and it may be one that requires ritual in itself uh, to address uh, the lineage from, from which it may come from. Um, so there are 
uh, ways to look into where does this, where does this uh, severance of belonging, where did it occur? And how long has it been alive? And is it really yours or did you just come in to help heal it um, for yourself and those before you? So there are certain inquiries that I would uh, want to look to with you to figure out, you know, where, where, is, where are these obstacles to belonging? Um, and then what ritual prescriptions uh, would be suggestive of responding to those obstacles? Um, so we think of uh, that way of thinking about it, that, that, that ritual is a prescriptive response to our challenges. Um, you know, there's, a, there's an old Irish proverb that says the troubles in this world can only be mended from the other world. And the troubles in the other world can only be mended from this world. So there's this reciprocal relationship uh, to our ancestors. Um, when I say ancestors, I don't mean the unwell dead. It's a different category, but more the bright and shiny realm of helping ancestors that are to assist in, in the healing of those kind of things. Uh, so usually when people bring me questions of that, of belonging, um, it, it leans me more toward thinking about earth rituals as a potential response uh, that may be called for. But I would need to look more specifically into uh, where, where is the obstacle? When did it begin? Um, so it may not be your own that you're feeling that may have been there before you. Is that helpful? Yes, um, and could it have to do with actual ancestors, uh, genealogy and lineage? Absolutely. Yeah, a lot of times patterns of belonging have, uh, or, or disconnection <clears throat> have been set in place uh, ancestrally, blood lineage. Um, or when we're adopted, we still sign on to the frequency of that lineage. So it's, it's in the lineage that these patterns of, of uh, disconnection and a search for belonging may have occurred. Um, it could have occurred culturally, as we've seen in many different cultures, um, of people being dislodged or forced from. Um, and those, those feelings of belonging begin, you know, then start to move through the the bloodline like a hungry ghost um, looking for healing. Um, and so it would also tell me, um, Valerie, that because you see this, you must also have the antidote of healing it. Because mm. um, there are others who have fallen uh, to that, uh, maybe within your lineage have fallen to that turmoil um, and never saw it. So there's something about you seeing it that tells me you must somewhere in there have the antidote uh, or resources to activate the antidote um, for healing. I think I'm doing it. Mm -hmm. um, I, I also feel I need more from someone. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, looking into that, that uh, feeling of needing more from someone, that would be the, the portal to dive into. Um, and, and what is the connection uh, to those someones uh, that are needed, you know? Um, oftentimes we project that, that sense of disconnection onto the human population and, and the search for that someone. Yeah. Um, and that's not where the, where the uh, disconnect often is. We, you know, that kind of search often ends in you know, finding plenty of someones that never, never complete or, or fill the void. Um, so I would be curious to look more deeply into that with you about what is this connection looking for? And, and is it in, uh, you know, is it ancestrally? Is it, uh, you know, your relationship to your own spirit helpers? Um, you know, what is it, what is the connection that needs to be fed? 
Well, I liked that Irish proverb a lot. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that caught your attention. Uh, County Mayo. <laughs> there you go. Just around the corner from my people. <laughs> so, yeah, so there's something there. Um, you know, that tells me immediately some about at least the cultural dislocation of belonging that occurred for, you, for those people, for those ancestors. Um, when I went to Ireland, I felt like I went home. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I could breathe the air so yeah. wonderfully, the moist air and all the green. Yeah. So there, there would be, again, if I was to prescribe an earth ritual just based on what I'm hearing, there would be, I would not only want to connect you ancestrally, but connect you to the very land to get some of that earth um, and to begin to uh, connect with that, uh, the land that remembers your name. Um, and begin to work with that so it's healed this mm. earth is often the is the elemental response to uh, an, a belonging need so this is let everybody know we're at the top of the hour and um, that was very good <laughs> dialogue Valerie I think, thank you for bringing that I wish we could um, allow everybody's time to um ask their questions and allow um, cater to create some dialogue, but we, I think we would need probably the whole evening here. So, <laughs> um, and so cater, I, I might end this one a different way. If you don't mind, I'll allow you some time to share your free gift and then we'll end with like some words of wisdom from you. If you, if you feel comfortable doing that. Oh, that a lot. Free gift, thanks. So if you, um, if you sign up for the newsletter, you'll one receive a, a audio version of a story called Singing Stone, a story that I learned originally from Stephen Foster and Meredith Little some 28 years ago, um, that I have taken the storyteller's license of, of great embellishment, by, but at the same time keeping the, the plot line pure. <laughs> and um, so you get that automatically. Um, the other is that if you sign up within the the window of this um, summit, you'll, your name will be entered into a drawing for a cowrie shell divination. Um, and you can read about that in the material. I think Ben has a link somewhere. Yeah, and if you look on Cater's speaker page, you'll see his, um, his free gift and then also his website where you can find um, his bio and read more of his bio and also his information there. Um, um, yeah, okay. Um, so is there any words of wisdom you want to leave us with or to be a short story? What are you feeling pulled for? Mm. <laughs> Maybe a short story. We're going to run over just slightly, but that's okay. Yeah. Boy, Maladama shared with me. I love this story because um, it, it's really that whole death is your ally story. So he told me this story. He said, yes, in, in the village, uh, there was this man one night that was asleep in his hut. And he woke up in the middle of the night <clears throat> and he turned and there was death sitting right there beside of him. And he just, he freaked out, you know, he said, oh, scared him to death. And he got up and he started running. He ran, he ran, he ran, he ran. And, um, and then he paused and he thought about it for a moment and he thought, this isn't far enough. You know, death's probably still close. So he took off running again and he ran way into the night and he, he was exhausted. He fell over, fell asleep. Um, and then, you know, how that jolt, sometimes your body will get when it jolts awake. Well, that happened to him and he jolted awake and he thought about it again. He said, oh, this is not far enough. So he took off running again and he ran, he ran, he ran to the furthest outpost village he could get to. And, uh, finally just collapsed from exhaustion, couldn't even wake up, not even with the jolt from his, his neurons firing in his brain, he just was out. Nightfall came on, he starts to finally wake up as the evening's coming on again, he's finally waking up, he opens his eyes and he looks beside him and there's death looking right at him again. And his eyes get big as saucers and death looks at him and death says, I came to see you way back there in the first village to tell you I would meet you here. <laughs> oh what life i missed 
that's my the teaching of death as an ally. You know, mm -hmm. they can teach us how to live and, and to love and, uh, mm -hmm. and, and yeah, yeah, just to, 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 live a, to live a good life, to, to live well and die well, as they say. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Kater. And, and thank you, everybody, from come to circle around the fire with your video, even, even though it's, it seems like it's weird. It can be awkward for some of us, but thank you for sitting with us and hearing from Cater today. And, and uh, Cater, I just really, really appreciate it, as always, when I hear your words. And I hope that um, all the listeners and the viewers are um, really listening to this call and this, um, the soul stirring that you are awakening in all of us. So I appreciate that. Thank, Thank you. It's been a real honor to be here and it's good to see everybody. Thank you all for, for joining. And as we sit the fire, um, we can, um, the way, a good way to end this instead of just all of this logging off at once is you can feel free to just look at everybody. And it's always nice to look at everybody's faces and then you can nod when you're handing off or just give a sign and just log off at your own will. But. Thank you, Ben, for making this possible. You're welcome, Mariana. It's good to see you again. Thank you, Ben. I've never met you, but I'm really grateful for what you're doing. I wish you well. Go well, everybody. Bye. Bye-bye.